How do we pr produce the fruit trees? We have a number of fruit trees in the food forest there, and that's what we're going to talk about today. And going back to my original intro, today we're going to kind of hand the teaching part over to Jed. He's the next generation, and we feel it's important, one, to show the youth that kids can do this stuff. I mean, my uh, 11 and 8-year-olds are in there showing how to make cuttings and selling plants. And uh, this guy, he's 14, Jed, and he's amazing. He can do things you can't even imagine in the woods. And uh, you just dump him in the middle of Trinity Alps and he'd get out alive by himself. And he knows how to think. Prunes my dad's orchard. He knows all these different varieties of fruits. And I always have to ask him, what was that one name again? And how do you do that again? <laughs> Little brains like fade and his just like eating it up. So he's going to share with you how to graft and I can kind of interject whenever I have something from my background. And then we're going to do some demos and show you some of the details about grafting. I've been teaching grafting workshops for like 20 years. And it's amazing how out of a group of, say, 10 people, there will be two people that just, it's a natural gift for them. Once they see it, it's like that, and like, man, you've got it. And then there will be most of the people that have to, how's that? Uh, get it a little more smooth. They keep trying after like the sixth try. I think that'll work. And then there will be two people that just, yeah, I just can't do it. And they just have a lot of trouble. So it just takes a lot of practice if you're one of those people. And we're going to try to show you some of those techniques, the tools of the trade, and how to do it. And, uh, Without further ado, I'll hand it over to Jed. Okay, so some of you guys here know a lot about grafting, but others don't know as much. And hopefully, everyone will come out with things that they learned today. So, the first thing I want to touch on is what is grafting? Well, grafting is uniting a short stem of one plant, like a scion to a close botanical relative that has roots, the stalk. You, the scion is from a tree that you like. Okay, that my neighbor has my favorite type of apple. I'll get a piece of scion from his tree and graft it onto a root stalk. That's what you do. So, why do you do that? Why do you graft? And it's the thing that I just touched on. You want a special type of fruit. And you can use rootstocks known to perform well countrywide. They're resistant to disease and adverse soil conditions. Adverse soil conditions means like clay soil or sandy soil. And main rootstocks that are used in the United States are MM111 and M106. And there are a few different sizes of rootstocks. There's dwarf semi dwarf and standard. And usually with clay soil, you want to pick the size up. So instead of getting a dwarf, you want a semi dwarf, or instead of a semi dwarf, you want standard. And you can use root, just like what I said, you can use root stocks to determine the size of your tree. Instead of having a 15 foot tall tree, you can have a 6 foot tall tree. You don't need a ladder. <laughs> <laughs> and you can, just like I said, re reproduce a specific tree or cultivar. So it has superior roots, size control, and you can clone varieties. So what type of wood are you looking for? Well, you're looking for clean two nodes, like see clean two nodes like this. And, and we'll pass stuff yeah, around we'll later so you guys around. can get more of a hands-on close-up. Let's say this is a branch. So you cut right above a bud like that. And two clean nodes like this. Break the bottom off and you slice sideways. I'll talk more about that later. So you want the sign wood from the specific tree that you want to reproduce. And thickness is another key because since there are different types of grafting, you want certain pieces of sign wood for the different types. But today we're touching on whip grafting. And you want it to be about a quarter inch thick to three eighths inch thick, thick. Those are ideal sized widths. And you can, with the rootstocks, you don't have to have a named 
variety. You can just go dig up an apple seedling and transplant it, graft onto it. There you have it, free apple tree. So the equipment you'll need are the Victorinix or alternate Swiss Army knives. You can get the old timer grafting knives and they won't work as well because they're not as sharp. You'll have rough edges and the grafts won't go together as well. You want the cleanest graft you can make. And we're kind of giving you guys the, the textbook perfect version. I've seen in the course of teaching this class every kind of knife you can imagine. I mean, from the carpenter that came in, he had a utility knife to every kind of pocket knife. Most of them just don't work great. You can get away with anything, but if you want the ideal cut, this. But there was one time this guy was a hunting guide from Idaho, and he came here to commercial fish. He pulls out this big old like buck knife, and his son or his work, big grizzled guy, I don't think that'll work. Let me give it a try. And the branch stood there for a second, it was like laser sharp. Everybody was like, darn, he had made the thing out of spring steel himself, and it was like laser sharp. Yeah, I guess that one will work. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing you'll need are sealants, like this. Without this, you can't have a graft tape, because the graft will dry out before it has time to fall onto the tree. Which, and, uh, what kind is that one right there? Is that an asphalt type or a... Yeah, it's just a car, like liquid car. Okay. And there's all these different brands, they're all the same basic thing. You don't, have, we, to, what's that? you don't have to have a special brand of tree seal. Everyone, like, we've tried them all and they all work. Okay. Yeah. We'll touch more on the tree seal later when we actually show you how to grab. Another thing you'll need is tape. Rubber line electrician's tape is the best. I've seen people use rubber bands. But you really want something that disintegrates when exposed to UV light over time. My dad's used actual graphing tape that doesn't fall apart when UV light hits it for like three months. It'll just stay there for a few years. And it will end up choking out your tree. And even if your tree somehow deals with it, it'll still snap off extremely easily. Another thing you'll need is disinfectant. You don't want to go graft like 100 trees and one of those trees just happen to have some bacteria. You spread that all over and all of the trees end up with some bacteria and they die. Another thing you'll need is first aid supplies. <laughs> you never go when you end up cutting yourself. About every year, my grandfather comes back to his house bleeding all over, and he has to get bandaged up. So you want to be ready. That doesn't happen all the time, but like with everything, you have access. And since he's in the other room, I can tell you that one time he forgot to fold it, and he tried to put it in his back pocket. Oh, oh that was bad. <laughs> And one time I was actually grafting, and all of a sudden the ground just started turning red, and I'm like, what's with all this red stuff? Looked, and a chunk of my finger was gone. I never even felt it. Just took the, the knuckle of my finger and clear off. These things are, when you, especially when you get them new, they are wicked sharp. So be careful. Did you your knuckle back on? Yeah. <laughs> Another thing you'll need is the tree seal. This is a package of labels. So you don't have, let's say, five different varieties of scion. And you go graft the trees, then you come back a week later and you ask, what types of trees are these? I forget what order I put them in. So you can actually label each tree. Okay, this tree is golden delicious, this one has pink pearl, this one has honey crisp, like that. So the theory of the stock in the sign you'll need. So some sign is not compatible with some stock. Like you can't graft a peach tree scion to a peach root stock. That won't work. It'll the sign will just die. But apple is compatible with apple, plum is with plum. So you have to look at charts and we have one here and you can ask the permaculture guild 
people about them and even just look them up online. So you want the cambial regions of the rootstock and the sign to be in intimate contact so they can heal over and grow. Yeah. And you want the grafting to be done at the proper time when they're dormant. If you do it in summer, it'll dry up. It won't work. The leaves will fall off and it'll die. All cuts need to be sealed immediately after grafting. And just like I said, it'll dry out. It isn't fun. I've had it happen before. And rain can also also wash this thing off if it rains soon after you graft. I've actually done where I had root stalks about this tall planted in the ground. I'm going on grafting when the rain started. So I just took a plastic sandwich bag and just set over the top and it was like a little umbrella and the tree sealed <laughs> slowly, even though the humidity was so bad, slowly dried inside there and kept the rain off. But I've had rows of trees where it just washed it clear off. It was still too moist and come back and now that stuff's in the ground and your trees are exposed and you lose a few grafts. And you need to protect grafts from anything that can harm them or displace the cambial layers or even snap it off. Yes? I may have missed this, but what is the disinfectant that you use? Alcohol? What percent? No, it's the 91 percent isopropyl, not the 70 percent. This gets a little stronger, but um, a lot of the, the text will tell you bleached. If you stick a tool in bleach in five minutes, it's ruined. It just rusts the chemical reaction of that chlorine and the metal just destroys them. So I don't ever use bleach in any way, shape, or form. But when I was an arborist, they had these commercial disinfectants that were like super toxic. We just use plain old alcohol. It doesn't hurt you if you spill it on you. And it seems to do a pretty good job. When I didn't use it, we'd have a viral infection and wipe out a whole row of trees. When I did use it, never had a problem. So it must be working. Where do you get that strength, alcohol? Anywhere. Um, we usually get a CVS right over here. And it's 97%? 91%. 91%. Yeah. You, you don't go do that at all? You just no, no, I want to straight and nuke any bacteria or fungus that are on there. This humid climate, the fungus, bacteria, and viruses are just thick. I mean, we're breathing them. And so it's really easy to get infections. And you look at all these old uh, apple and pear and plum trees around here, especially associated with these old buildings like this there. 100 plus years old, and if you look at them, they're covered with cankers and lesions, and the trees are surviving, they're coping with it, but they're loaded with inoculum. So it's really important to have the alcohol, I think, to keep your grafts from getting infected. So you want to keep your graft safe. That means you can plant your tree in a certain location where there aren't going to be kids or animals, but that's kind of hard to do around here with so many deer, raccoons and stuff. So one of the things you can do is put a fence around it. That'll keep it safe from the deer and children. Do you have problems with uh, like uh, little uh, or rolling polies or whatever? They seem to no, no. Right. The, where you get in, into trouble with that is in potting soil in your pots. If you have too much organic content, not so much like peat moss, but like I've gotten cheap and got some sawdust and some compost and made my own potting soil, you get infested bad with uh, the little millipedes or the little roly poly type, you know, sow bugs and uh, pill bugs. And I know the local native nurseries, they've had headaches with that in the last few years where they got a batch of potting soil from somewhere and it was, had too much coarse organic content and they just got wiped out with little soil organisms. So. Um, but plant straight in the ground, we haven't had any problems. I mean, even like in the eco garden, it's an ecosystem. You lift it up, and whoa, what is all that stuff that's moving? There's so much life in there, but it's in balance, and we don't have any problem with root rot or any roots being chewed. How long do you have to go before you can remove the fence? How tall do you As far as the graft goes, maybe two years, I'd say. One year, it's pretty much, you know, the, the bark is all healed up and everything, but it's still not super thick structurally. After two years, the tree's pretty good to go. But the problem is then, I mean, even a, a tree that's a seedling, I mean, if you have deer and stuff around, they're going to come and just eat it. So, so the tree has to be at least five or six feet tall? Yeah. yeah, I mean, we have trees that we've planted that were, say, seven feet tall, and the deer come and just pretty much mow everything off. And then, like, we have one tree, actually, in McKinleyville, 
and it was I don't know, seven, eight feet tall when we planted it. And they just pretty, pretty much ate everything off the bottom and re sprout, they'd eat it off. But the window up about six feet or so from there up, it just became like a mushroom and grew out. So mm -hmm. if you're going to just live with deer, which we do a lot of times, I mean, how many people have time to you know, spray deterrents or put up a fence or whatever? You can live with a lot of animals like that. You're just going to take a little longer to get fruit and have to put up with an abused tree. <laughs> um, you were talking about pests. Just now, I had a seedling that somebody gave me of a, a Santa Rosa plum tree. And the first year I planted it, it was covered with aphids and ants. And I don't know how to um, discourage that again. That was the only tree that had ever happened to me. And we ended up just squirting it off yeah. every day. But it was in danger of dying. So They're I don't pretty easy had experience control. with that. You know, with a brand new ceiling being overcome with aphids and ants, have you had that experience? It's pretty common around here. Just use some. You can get all kinds of organic soaps. I mean, and you can't like put that. a fence around for. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but nothing worked except squirting, and I wondered how you discourage that. Tangle foot will work. It's yeah, you a gummy tangle thing foot. you put around the the trunk. It's you know oh. real gummy. So oh. it's the, you have to understand that the ants. And the aphids are like partners. Oh, I and know if you what all about the ants going <laughs> up, then the aphids yes. won't come. Or yeah, we used less to, tendency. To we used to come. use that on all of our trees. We, huh? You put Tangle. a piece of duct tape around the trunk. Or, actually, this stuff would be ideal because it's stretchy. But some kind of tape, and then you just plaster it tangle foot. All the nurseries sell it. It's just a beeswax goo type oh. stuff. And the the ants come up, and they can't get through it, and then they can't move the aphids around. They can't protect the right. aphids, and then the aphids are easy to control from there. Do you have a question? I was just thinking, like, <coughs> in the interest of time, can we do questions at the end? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, unless it's, you know, direct, like, oh, I, I don't understand what you're saying on that with the grafting. Let's, uh, you know, feel free to speak out about that. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So the first thing you do is cut the rootstock to the desired height. You have a rootstock in the ground. You want it from about 8 to 12 inches tall. And you get your sawdown two buds, as much wood as possible below the second bud. And make sure your cut was as close to the bud. So let's say you want this piece of sign wood. You want your cut, you want your cut to be as close to this node as possible. Was that as close to the note above it or below it? Below it. So then you can have room to carve down here without destroying both buds. And you want to cut your sign at a steep angle so both the sign and the rootstock line up correctly so you don't have a weirdo graph pointing off in this direction or this direction. You want your angle to be at about 25 degrees on the bottom of the sign and on the top of the rootstock. And make sure you cut these faces smooth. If they're rough, it won't align as well and snap easier and be harder for it to heal over. After you cut the vertical faces, then you'll make an incision. I'll show you in a couple of minutes how to do it. Then you slide the two faces down each other and make sure they're in well. Don't slide them too far or he'll snap the whole thing apart. I've got a question. Yes. How important is it that the scion and the root sock are the same size? So you can have both sides of the cambium line up correctly. You can get away with lining up just one side of the cambium on like a thick like that. So like this, if you have inch a, thick and let's say your rootstock is three quarters of an inch, and all you have available is thin scion wood, which is very common, you just scoot it over to one side and get one side lined up and it'll be fine. Mm -hmm. But having said that, it's ideal to have them perfectly matched up, but in the real world that almost never happens. You know, you start running out of good scion wood. A lot of times you'll have a tree, like somebody says, hey, my uncle's got this little homestead down in Southern Humboldt, we got these ancient trees. But all the young sprouts, the new growth, they're like, it didn't grow very much last year because of the drought. They're like that thin. And 
that's all you have available is this thin stuff. And then you've got, you know, maybe a half inch or so root stock. You can make it work, just scoot over to one side. Mm -hmm. But if you have them like that, do you have to cover that then to prevent like we, oh, infection? Any time you graft, you cover it. So that's, so yeah, he'll, he'll, we'll do a demo here, but that's okay. what the tape and the tree seal are for because, yeah, that would dry out and die. It'd kill that and it would destroy the top of this. So you just cut the cover that So you hold the thing together so it won't get knocked over by the wind, you'll use the grafting tape. And what you do is you just stretch it out, then wrap it around, and it'll glue to itself and the tree. You said you like the regular electrician's tape. Just is that normal electrician tape? No, no, no. it's electrician splicing tape no. that disintegrates with UV light. Okay. So if you're taking notes, the specific terminology, because there's several different varieties, is rubber lined electrician splicing tape. It has to be lined. They have a version that's not lined and it's not as good. And there's another version that just doesn't seem to break down as well. This stuff, the liner, basically keeps the, the multiple layers in the roll from touching each other so they don't glue together. Once you wrap that on your graft, it basically melts together and creates a perfectly sealed, and it's, since it's stretchy, it pulls on itself. And it does a really good job, almost like a cast on a broken arm of holding that thing together. And that's why once I started using that, even in rains, which usually you're crafting in the rain on uh, a nursery setting, this, that stuff sealed the, the graft so well, this didn't dry out. Maybe the top bud died because the tree seal washed off the top, but the lower bud would survive because it was protected by the dead stub on top. And then that, that tape actually did the sealing job around the joint, even with the tree seal washed off. So this, Tape is highly superior. I used to lose five to six out of 100 trees a year because of the grafting tape that would just lock it and it would grow in diameter and the tree would snap off. With this stuff, it just continues to grow and then the sun breaks it down. I have two questions. One is uh, we have a bunch of grafts with just regular electrician tape. When should you remove them? How do you know the graft is taken and you can say? Once you see these buds take off and start growing. Once these buds are, you know, two inches long or so, then the, the cambium is already fused together and it's growing. So then just very carefully slice it and peel it off. But that's what's nice about this. You don't have to do further damage on the graft unit or potentially jerk the thing off because you just walk away from it. So the other question is, should the scion be mounted on the <coughs> After you tape the area down here, you'll want to tree seal it and tree, tree seal the place where the sawn and the rootstock meet and seal the top end of the sawn. And let's say you come back a month later and the sawn buds didn't tape, they died. It may be because the cambion was not lined, not lined up correctly like this, you accidentally bumped it when you were taping it, or you have rough bases, and that also makes it so the campium does not line up correctly. And rain washing the tree seal off can make it dry out, which I've had happen. But if you do a really good job with the bottom cut, you can have the bottom bud take and the top bud die, even though the top tree seal got washed off. And other thing, unprotected graft. Someone steps on it, animal runs by, steps on it, an animal eats it. I've had people step on them before, which is not very fun. Or you have incompatible scion, like a peach, like I said earlier, peach, scion with a peach rootstock, or an apple piece of scion with a plum rootstock, that doesn't work. It has to be apple root, apple sign with apple rootstock, plum sign with plum rootstock, or peach sign with a certain type of kuwa rootstock. Yeah, I forget, I forget exactly, but you can figure out. Do you remember exactly? There's actually a Lovell, Lovell peach rootstock, and then a the marble and plum. Yeah. We'll take a peach. I tried grafting plum, Santa Rosa plum onto 
apricot, the graph took immediately, it leafed out, and that's all it ever did. It was a permanent bonsai the size of the sun. But every year it would leaf out, it was super healthy, and it just stayed, the, it looked just like this. You know, I had a rootstock that was about a foot tall and my little nice three inch cyan wood. Yeah, beautiful little tree. Could have put it in a half gallon pot in a windowsill, it would have done fine, but it never got fruit. Another problem? Yes. Can you put the hat back on the plum tree? Yeah, you have to reverse what I did. I did it the wrong okay. order. Another problem? Yes. And then, um, it, like, in regards to, like, to pears and, like, apples, like, um... We've never tried that, but you can get the compatibility charts. You can probably Google them, and uh, it'll tell you a lot of them are partially satisfactory. Yeah. So, like, I had a partial, it was less than partially satisfactory, but um, it'll tell you, you know, where on the scale they are. Some of them they'll do okay some of the time. Is, is that chart um, in U.S.? DA or is that uh, California Extension? Which one is, yeah, California Extension Service. So we can find that online? Yeah, you should yeah. be able to. And if you can't, get a hold of one of us and we should have copies of it. I looked at it, it said the graph is unsatisfactory between apple and pear. Actually, pear and apple is the same. It's unsatisfactory. It means it may take, but it won't do very well. Mm -hmm. And the big key on these rootstocks, I don't know how much you mentioned it earlier, but the rootstocks like the M111, 106, those are specifically bred for resistance to like woolly apple aphid, all these viruses and bacteria. And so you want to go with one of those if you can. One more question. How many bugs do you like to leave on the file? That's a really good question. What's your preference? Two. Is it bad if you leave more? Well, it can have up to four. The problem was you can put you can put a whole twig on there. I've seen people do that, but with the graft, you want to, once it grows, you want to break all but one off. You want to select the healthiest shoot. And so when I had a commercial nursery, I was doing three because that was what I read was the standard. And I had to waste hours and hours going back through my 500 grafts, breaking two of the three off because I had like a 96% success rate, which was like off the chart for the industry. And and then all three buds would grow almost every time. So I had to waste a ton of time thinning and then coming back and cutting pieces off. And so we switched down to two just to reduce the amount of wasted time. So we go with two and almost every time both of them take. It's um, maybe five out of a hundred, one of them's a dead bud or gets snapped off later. But two is pretty much the ideal. You can let them both grow or you can, usually what I do though is come back and and pinch or cut one off so it's just one. That forces all the growth into that thing and gets you a big boost in your establishment of the tree. You get to focus all the energy into that one bud. And another problem is a poorly rooted rootstock. You can have a rootstock that has two roots coming off of it and it doesn't, like two baby roots, it doesn't get established, it dies so the sign dies too. I guess now I'll, I'll show you how to make a graph. We, uh, one, one thing we didn't mention is the, the timing. You said obviously you don't want to do it in the summer, but you know, there's, I'm a little uncertain on whether it's better to do it uh, you know, earlier versus later. Is it just temperature related? You know, how do you target your uh, you know, best drafting timing season? Well, sometimes. The weather can have a little bit to do with it. Sometimes you'll have a warm spell and everything will weep out a week earlier than it did last year. So you really want to pay attention to the weather, pay attention to the trees, and usually about now for apples is great. Maybe a week ago for plums. Like we just checked one of our plums I wanted to bring. We have a really special plum tree. It's a wild one. And it has this insane flavor. There's nothing else like it anywhere. And we wanted to bring some graft wood today. Too late, we missed it. It's already exploded. Every year that happens, like, ah. So I haven't grafted plums for a long time because every year it's like, how did it get February already? It's just too late. <laughs> Apples, still good to go. They're totally dormant. I noticed we checked some pears this morning, not getting graft wood off those pears. They're already exploding. So it's basically dormancy. And that's somewhere between December and now. 
And it's just, like you said, you, some years it can be weeks off of what it was last year, either later or earlier. But the big thing is dormancy. Apples are more forgiving. Plums are a little less forgiving. Once the plums are blooming and leaving out, they're done. Now, there's other types of grafting techniques that can buy you some time. And like citrus, they do in the middle of summer because they're budding. They actually slice a little thing in the bark, cut a bud off and stick it in there. It's a whole different physiology there. But with the whip grafting for making new trees, you really want to do it like in early January is pretty much ideal. So it has to be dormant. But it needs to be a warm spell or, you know. No, no, it's totally yeah. untemperature related as okay. far as when you do it, the temperature and weather, though, dictates when it starts to pull out. So you just want the plants to be dormant. All right, cool. Um, this might be an obvious question, but is there a difference between grafting these things on rootstock and grafting them to a tree branch? No, no difference whatsoever. That's a great question. And you can get, you know, name rootstocks, you can dig suckers off of somebody's tree or you can graft them right onto a tree. I know a guy in come with like 40 different varieties on one tree, red, green, yellow. Right. Because I have this a very successful tree, but, but I don't like the apples. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's grafted over. So he's going to go ahead and demonstrate how you actually do it. And this is, you know, you can Google it, you can hear about it, but until you actually see it done by somebody who's done it and then start practicing, that's when you start picking it up. And like he said, the biggest key, smooth cuts. The smoother his cuts are, the better you can get at least one side of the cambium to line up. And on an apple, if you get the cambium to line up, even in one little, like, you know, in one or two millimeters of it, you're in. It'll take off, and then that, that part that grows together will start to spread, and pretty soon you got a, a brand new trunk. It's pretty amazing. Uh, different types of trees are easier than others, but apples are probably one of the easiest, so it's a good place to start. Yeah, with apples, you can be a little late. The buds are just starting to open up, and you can still graft them and have success. So let's say this is your tree branch. You would want this for your sign wood because it's pretty straight, has good, healthy buds. And that's two of the biggest keys right there. Straight, both on the rootstock and the sign wood, and healthy buds inspect them. If you see lesions, funky looking cankerous type stuff like this, these are willow branches we're using for demo, but right here in the middle is a funky lesion that smells like virus or bacteria to me. Chuck it. Get a nice, preferably a nice overall healthy tree, but then especially the section you're cutting from, make sure it's pretty healthy. You see funky, suspicious looking stuff. You don't need to be a plant doctor to see that. Looks like somebody took a blowtorch to it. You don't want to be getting your tools covered with fire blight. So you want the largest area between the two buds that you're going to be cutting in. So we'll cut like right here. Trim the top off. So then this is your graft. Could you do a couple of those and pass them around? Yeah. Yes. We have. And one thing to mention of that, I was going to say that guy that, I don't know if he's still here, was here earlier, asking about where to get grafting knives. I don't know why, but almost all of them they make are left handed knives. And the, yeah. It's kind of hard to tell, but if you look at the blade, it's, it's one side is perfectly flat, and the other side the angle comes down. And I just got used to them. I use a left handed knife for my right hand, and I have 96% take. But if you turn it around and don't go towards yourself, but pull it like this as if you were pushing with your left hand, you tend to get a little better cuts, but I don't think it's that big a deal. I mean, I have had a successful nursery doing it this way with a left handed knife. And, well, but just so you guys know, and if you ever find a right-handed knife, give me a call and I'll get it from you. So you, you pick the two buds and you clip off the top of the sign? You don't have a top bud? It depends on where your sign is located. You can have a piece of sign with a top bud and have success. But you only want two buds on your sign, maybe three. Okay. No, but you are trimming your uh, sign immediately above your top bud. Yeah, so exactly. you do have a top bud. Is that yeah. what so, what, you know, when I was in production, I like to say I wanted to produce uh, um, Rhode Island greening apple. 
and we had one tree in the entire county that we knew of, and it wasn't that big. I wanted to do 50 of them. I didn't have a very big selection of graft wood. So, you know, I'd go cut the eight pieces of sawn wood, and that was all I had. And so I'd use pretty much the whole thing. But if I had, you know, I was doing, say, Waltana or Golden Delicious, and I had basically an entire county of trees, I'd start at the base and work my way up. When I got up to the where it started getting thin, and there was a tip bud, I'd cut that off and chuck it. You know, you can be real choosy. And I usually like two good side buds. They tend to do better tip buds. I can't explain it, but I never liked them too much for the sake of doing a graft, and the side buds seem to feel a little better, especially because the tip just starts getting real thin. So you cut your side wood at the desired angle. So there's a rule of thumb when you have a piece of side wood and you're cutting your angle on the base. It should be about an inch and a quarter plus or minus. It depends on how thick, but that's one of the common mistakes is people basically cut a 45 degree angle there and their cut is like a quarter inch long. That's just not going to work. It can't, there's nothing to stick together. It'll just fall off. So I go anywhere from about an inch to, if it's a big thick piece, two inches long. But you want that angle. So you cut your side wood and you cut your rootstock. Make sure you don't have any, make sure you don't have any buds on the rootstock near your graft. And you notice how thin the piece, and we've grafted a ton that's like, you know, sixteenth of an inch wide. The thinner the piece of sign wood is, the shorter the cut usually is to get the proper angle. But then if you get stuck with either grafting a bigger branch on a tree or a big rootstock, that angle is going to be two to maybe almost, this one's almost three inches long. Just whatever you have to do to make the sign wood stand up straight. So if I had, had a shorter cut on here, this sign wood would be leaning like this. So I cut it long enough to get these two. I mean, if you compare these two on the big piece, it's almost twice as long to get the straight up and down tree. And does that thing kind of seep into kind of the middle? Of that slice on the bigger yeah. stem, or the, on the uh, on the rootstock there, so the bigger diameter, is that thing uh, sitting right on the top or kind of on the side? It's on the side, kind of sitting in the middle. Yeah, you, you shove it. Way. What I do is I stick it in there on one side, to see how it matches up. And I don't really like that. I'll take it out, stick it on the other side. Ooh, that side's nice and smooth. It can be. I can't even see the green. I can see the light in there. It's a nice match. So I, I check both sides to see which one gives me the best match. And then you want to just wiggle it around to get it nice and smooth. So when you're cutting the side, you have basically two things you're looking for. The angle of the cut so that it stays upright and then the actual surface where the two are going to meet. Right. Be inch and, that, that's what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. inch and a quarter, inch and a half, depending on how thick they like that one you did. It's such a thin piece, you can't make it real long. <laughs> So then you cut a notch, both the side wood and the rootstock. And this is where you have to be super careful because yeah. we've all lost some blood on this issue. <laughs> Don't be in a hurry. Make sure you take your time. <laughs> is that why what those are sticking that? together? Yeah, I made a notch like he's doing okay. there on both pieces. So now instead of just being like this, it's actually like this, and then you're sliding them together. And like he mentioned earlier, one of the mistakes I see people do is they make their notch and then they <laughs> jam it together and it just <laughs> splays it all out and now they've destroyed both pieces and you have to start all over again. Sometimes when you're cutting you'll peel some bark and a lot of ways you can damage it and have a very unclean surface. Go ahead and just chop it off and start over. You know, it's not like you're in a big hurry. You want to make sure you take the time. I, you know, sometimes people have to do it eight or nine times, keep chopping it down. One, issue I've heard is some nurserymen are like, oh no, you cut the rootstock off, you know, right above the ground and graft onto that. Well, what if you foul it up? Now you just killed the whole root, ruined the rootstock. Mm -hmm. I cut them off about a foot, and then if I uh, mess up with a knife or, you know, it's like, ah, oh, I keep getting the bad angle and it's all rough. Now I can just chop it off and start over and I have a bunch of chances to do it over. I still have some rootstock to work with. And these rootstocks are tough. Mouse comes and chews on it, weed eater hits it, and they keep going. If you graph down here and the whole thing is named variety, they're not as tough. I mean, they're a lot easier to get chewed up by a mechanical or 
biological or whatever adversaries. So I like to cut them off about a foot. Would you show us um, yeah. where the canyon is on that tree? And yeah, we'll pass some of these around in a minute. What the canyon is? It's just the green stuff just inside the bark. So here's your piece of electrician splicing tape. You peel the blue film off. Where do you guys buy that at? All the hardware stores, Ace Hardware. Uh, Ace and McKinley usually carries it. So you have your side wood and right stock lined up correctly. The cambium's lined up. It doesn't have to be on both sides. It if you have to, it can be on just one side. And you stretch your tape. Wrap it around the graph. So you really have to be careful when you're doing the stretching. Yeah, that's a you know, read, unalign them. He kind of went through the troubleshooting things of what can go wrong. That's one of the biggest I see. I'll actually watch somebody doing it. They'll, you see that the sign went, well now that perfect lineup you had is long gone. And then they, they can't see it because it's under the tape. They wrap it, oh, done, I'll tree sealed, see you next year. How come my graft didn't take and it's shooting suckers off the bottom? Because you jerked it. And one trick I like to do is I actually slice a piece of this tape down the middle so it's in half this way. When it's skinny like this, it's a lot stretchier and more supple. And it's easier to fine tune on small twigs and branches. Where does that disinfectant come into play? Yeah. So that's usually at the start when you're uh, cutting your sign wood and cutting, doing any cuts, we spray the, the clippers and the knife. And yeah, do it so we don't gash you out and replace the alcohol. But you start with the disinfectant. Yeah, yeah, before we even cut anything, we spray the tools and maybe you know, set them out with the alcohol in them so it soaks. And, and then, like when I was doing 50 trees, you know, I would I used to do it every tree before I start making cuts. One time I thought, oh, I'll just do it every row. Why do I don't need to do it every time? And then one year in spring, all the trees started to grow except this one row, and they kind of started to leaf and they turned yellow, and then they all died because I spread a virus right on down the row. So that was every tree. So you just disinfect your tools, not the tree? Right, yeah, I don't spray the tree. So you open this. Let's say this is a paintbrush with the black tree seal on it. You paint this whole thing, including this spot, the little area above and below the electric spot. This is the brush. Paint. Usually these things come with an applicator brush. Yeah. You brush the whole thing, including those two spots, and you put a little bit on the top to seal it, on top of the side. And be careful not to plaster that bud on yeah. top. Just try to get right on the sur cut surface. Yeah, you'll suffocate the bud. Yeah. Um, I have a question. So. Uh, do you typically graft with your rootstock already planted up? Uh, yeah. You don't have to. I mean, I've seen, I've done it. I've seen people, you know, do up here and then go plant it. And a lot of times at the sign exchange, you might want to do it with one of the people that has experience. Is this right? Get it dialed in. Just wrap the roots with some wet paper towel, Kleenex or whatever, and put a bag around and take off. So it's totally doable, but it's ideal. I used to plant them so I know where it's going, and then. You can hold it, you have a lot of control over it, and walk away from it. Because it's really easy to have this, carry it out, and get in the cart. And yeah. walk it along. Okay. Can you show how to how you make that notch? Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll kind of come out a little closer to show that. Um, one of you asked about the cambium. So this is straight bark, the brown. This is cut past the cambium into the trunk. And then the bright green, I just shaved the outer bark off. That bright green is the cambium. So you can kind of see the three different parts of the, the willow. And all trees are the same way. They got the bright green cambium, the white wood inside, and then the hard bark. And so what you're trying to line up is that bright green stuff. It's pretty amazing. If you haven't ever done this before, and you do it, and then you watch that start to fuse, and the tape stretches and breaks off in the UV light, you're like, check that out. I mean, it's like this tissue is just finding each other from these two different pieces and it's fusing together. It's amazing to watch. This is one, I'll just pass these around. These are two pieces that are about the same size and it's not a perfect graph, it's willow, it's kind of funky. This is one that's 
way unmatched. It's like Larry was asking about, you know, they need to be the same size. Ideally, yeah, but we've done plenty that were, you know, the cyan wood was half the diameter of the, the base plant, the restock. And you just find one side, match it up, and you adjust it until you can't see any cambium. No bright green, no white trunk. You see the two bark. And this lower piece right here is perfectly maxed. That would be guaranteed to grow. So I'll pass these around. You can just kind of pass them that way. We'll make some more. If you were going to take that, the tape would go from where to where? That's a good question. I forgot to talk about that. Where would the tape go from where to where? So on this, I start at the bottom and go up because if you do that, it's like shingles shedding the water. And I would go on one like this from this side with none, with no sign wood, to this side, what that'll do is that'll squeeze this light, weak sign wood onto, it'll pull that, stretch that onto the rootstock. If you go this way, it can potentially pull that open and leave a gap there, and now you lost your seal. So I would start on this opposite side and go this way, pull that together. And just once, maybe around? Yeah, you just do it, you work your way from the bottom to the top, and just overlap slightly so the tape seals together. Once you get up to about here, I would just break this bud clear off. I got a third bud here. Just get that out of the way to make the trunk a little more smooth. Go all the way up just to the base of this bud so it's this whole cut face is completely sealed and disappears. Then you take the tree seal and just paint the whole thing. Try not to hit these two buds and just dab the top. And one thing to remember is the thicker the rootstock or sign would the harder it is to cut small piece of sign, I mean a thin piece of sign or a thin piece of wood, pretty much like three cuts you have it. Big piece takes yeah, the 15, density, 20 and the density. The density of the thicker wood is ridiculously more than thin pieces. You, you can actually order the rootstock in different diameters. And yeah. So it's actually like uh, cheaper to order uh, smaller diameter, like for getting some eighth inch peasants, perhaps. Yeah, and much more pleasant to graft. Yeah. There were years where they ran out of the small diameter stuff, and we were super bummed out. It was just, gear, gear. I mean, the difference is phenomenal. Quarter inch is wonderful, but it takes an extra year for those to get ready. Half inch is getting pretty thick. Three eighths is probably about ideal. It's best of both worlds. But yeah, the, you get a half inch or bigger, it's just, dense and really wears you out. That's what's nice about these knives though compared to like they I used to get grafting knives from the nursery suppliers and they were horrible. You'd waste so much energy in the course of a day of grafting where these just wow. Like little that samurai that swords. Equinox is that Victorinix. The Swiss Army brand. I'm wondering about how important the position of that vertical notch cut is across the diameter of your stock. Do you shoot from the middle or the side? Or That's the a really good question. Way? It doesn't make a huge difference. It can go anywhere. But ideally, let's see. It depends on the thickness of the graft wood. So usually on the cyan wood, I'll have it like if you have this face right here, I'll have it right in the middle pretty much every time. But on the rootstock, if you have a big thick rootstock, it's going to go higher than the middle. And if they're about the same diameter, both of them can go in the middle. Are you talking about the notch or what are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, the notch that you slice into here. Yeah, okay. On the cyan wood, I always put it in the middle. Right. And then if it's the same size, same diameter of rootstock, I'll put it in the middle, maybe just a hair above. And if it's, uh, as it gets thicker, I tend to go higher because of the mismatch. You'll have this thing slid way down here. I want to go back to timing. Now is the right time to do it. Right? Apple, right now, yeah. And plum, we should have done it a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. But um, there's no reason to wait. Once, once we, uh, once we start pruning our trees, right. that's also the time. Yeah. Do don't wait. Just get on. Once the stuff's dormant. Another issue that brings up a good point, though, we didn't think to mention is you can get order root stocks or dig up root stocks or make root stocks, whatever. 
and wrap them up in moist paper towel and then a plastic bag to keep moisture in. Throw them in the refrigerator. Go cut your sign away from your plums in December, throw them in the refrigerator, and then you can grab it in March, two months after it's too late, and it's not too late because you put it into an extended dormancy. And I've grafted trees almost in June, which you shouldn't because the soil temperatures are so warm, you can really shock the trees, but I've gotten away with it. So you can really manipulate plants with refrigeration. In the back? Uh, yeah, when you're uh, grafting this um, established tree, uh, how long before, how many seasons would it take before that sky would produce uh, fruit? On an established tree? Yeah. That's a great question. My dad, in his orchard, he had trees that were like 20 years old, and he didn't like the, some of the varieties, he decided to switch them over. One, I mean, literally whacked them down to almost nothing, it just trunks. And we cleft grafted those ones, and in two years they were producing fruit, and the trees overran the other ones because they had this massive established root system that was um, acclimated to the conditions there, but now had this new, you know, all that junky growth, old growth got cut off, new vigorous varieties, the thing exploded, and all those trees we did that too, way surpassed the other trees in production. It was pretty amazing. So it was only like two years and they were just cranking out fruit. So, okay, we missed the window for plums. As long as they're not flowering, is it, can we still? If they're leafing or flowering. Okay, it's not. Yeah, but swell, getting marginal. But the European plums are a little later, maybe they're still okay or no? Well, Just check them and see if, because I mean, you could be in Fieldbrook versus Fortuna and one's flowering and one's not, so just see if they're growing back. Yeah, it's not okay if the rootstock is starting to grow, but you can't you could try it. I've gotten away with some. It's just, it just starts getting sketchy. If you can keep both of them dormant, that's the ideal. Okay. So if you had an established tree, you'd say that you're going to cut off the top and you're going to put scions on. Uh -huh. on established trees, starting to bud, the scion is that, is that Typically not going to work. But if you used a bark graft, which we don't have time to demonstrate today, but... Um, Last year, Mark demonstrated it, and we can always show you real quick out there at our table, but bark grafting, you can get away with a lot more. We did it at Dick Hens' house, um, the first year we did this, four years ago, we bark grafted a bunch of his trees. They were already leafing out, the scions were leafing, and you just cut a slice in the bark of a big trunk you cut off, and then you insert the grafts into that. That's a way of reworking bigger trees. Boy, they just took off. Whip grafting doesn't respond that way. It's more for twigs of established trees or stuff up to you know, that diameter and, uh, and getting small rootstocks going. The slice that you make into the sign wood and the other, how deep does it have to go into? I go the, the depth of the blade. I, Slice it down until just the very tip of the, the back of the blade is sticking okay. out. But then when you mash the tube, you stick it all the way in? No, no, because what that'll do is that'll splay it all out so, and basically so, just so snap about everything. Half of that? So, yeah, about half. Just do it until it starts to hold and you can, you know, like that one I okay. handed out, it was standing on its own. Um, yeah. The, the, uh, the knife, is it sold as a grafting knife? Yeah. Specific graft, they have budding knife and grafting knife, and they're all sharp and they all do the same thing, but they have several versions. This is the one with the longest blade. The longest blade gives you more of a, a cutting stroke, so I like these ones. Is that something in the farm? They typically carry them. I don't know if they have them in stock right now, but my dad and I have been kind of tag team and teaching the grafting workshop there for years, and they have been trying to keep them in stock, so you could check there, and if they don't have them, then you could order them from forestry suppliers. Uh, and it looks like you're, you're uh, uh, right at the top of your taper there, you're sort of back cutting that a little bit. Is that? Yeah, right? what'll happen is the human arm tends to do a curve in the slice. You'll see that almost everybody does the same thing. Like, wow, that's nice and straight. And then you look real close. Oh, actually, I made a curve. Yeah. So I'll, I usually cut the top eighth to a quarter inch off. To, get rid of the top curve, and then I'll go back up here and just slice a little bit off just to shave it down so I have a fairly straight cut. I didn't think about that. I do it out of habit, but that was a good observation. So, you know, basically you're making your two cuts, make the slice, slide them together like that, and it's just enough to make them stand up, but not to start splaying it out. And if you have different diameters, try one side. If you don't like that matchup, move it to the other side. And try to get it to where the you don't see 
an air gap through the, the two pieces and you don't see a bunch of green candy. Like this, I got a surface here that I don't see anything. That's gonna take guarantee willow or apple or anything else. It's gonna fuse together. Boy, that hour went way too fast. So hopefully that all makes sense. And uh, there's several people around the room that know how to graft and can answer more questions and stuff. We'll be back there too. <laughs>